Hi, this is Steve Smith with Falafel Software. In this quick video, we're going to take a look at some Git basics. We're going to start off by checking out how to use the command line with Git. We'll create a repository on GitHub. We'll talk about the git ignore file, the dot git ignore file. We'll look at a tool for using Git visually called source tree. And then we'll look at the basic workflow of working with a Git repository, which may be unfamiliar if you've not used a distributed version control system in the past. The four commands that you'll typically use in order to work with a remote repository are clone, pool, commit, and push. I've got uh, a virtual machine here that I've installed source tree on, and that's all. I've created a console window here from source tree um, that lets us work in the local file system. So on my C drive, I've got a dev folder that we're looking at the contents of. In here, we're going to create a folder called hello git, which I've already done. So we're going to just change to that folder and look inside and we'll see there's nothing here. ls-a will show all files, including hidden files. Nothing exists. So the first step that we're going to do to work with git from the command line is run git init. And you can run this in any folder once you have git installed. And it will create a .git folder, which is how git manages everything. And you'll see in this shell window that I'm using that we're getting a little bit of extra information. Um, so you can see that it, it now has us on master as our branch for this local git repo. Now at this point, we can add a file. So say notepad foo.txt and create this new file and give it some content and save that. And over here on the right, you can see Windows Explorer showing the contents of this folder as well. Now on the left again, we can do git status, and it will show us that we're on the master branch, and we have some untracked files. We have foo.txt is in this folder, but it's not currently being tracked by git. Git doesn't know anything about it. We're going to add a couple more files. Let's add another file called .bar.txt, notepad, and we'll create this. And this is something that we don't want to check in. And maybe it's some user-specific settings. Because it's starting with a dot, it might also appear as hidden. So when we do ls, we don't see it. But if we do ls-a, we'll see all our hidden files. And this is very common when you're working with your IDE, where you might have some settings specific to your editor of choice, for instance, that you don't want to commit to the repository. So in order to support that, there's this concept of a git ignore file. And the git ignore file starts with a dot as well, because it's meant to be pretty much a hidden file. And so let's edit one of those. We'll just create one. And there's a bunch of different things you can do in here as far as uh, file globbing, where you can use wildcards to specify folders or files. In this case, we're just going to say dot bar, dot star. We don't want to be in there. Uh, we want git to ignore those types of files. We'll save that. And then if we do a git status again, we're going to see that it knows about dot git ignore. It knows about foo.txt but it does not see .bar.txt any longer because we've added it to the git ignore. At this point, we want to start tracking these files. So we're going to add them to our git repository. And to do that, we do git add. And you can add an individual file. So we could add foo.txt. You can also add star, which will add all of the files that match that wildcard. However, if you just add star, it won't match things like your .git ignore file because it's hidden. So we're going to say git add dot, which will add everything in the current folder. And then if we do git status once again, we'll see that it now has these two files. The next step is for us to do a commit. And when we do a commit, we're not pushing anything anywhere else. In fact, right now there is no anywhere else. Everything we're working with is purely local in this folder. But git commit is going to create a change set of these files that we've staged and will commit them to the repository and allow us to give it a commit message. So here we're going to do commit git commit dash m adding foo and git ignore. Now if we didn't want to add these two things in one commit, of course, we could have just added only the files we wanted separately and done a series of commits. Maybe we, maybe we wanted to have a message for each one that was separate. In this case, we're doing it expediently and we're just going to add them all. And now it's going to tell us, I don't know who you are. So you can do this globally and it'll show you how to do it globally right here in the error window or you can do it on a per repository basis which we're going to do in this case. So we're going to say git config not specify dash dash global and say user.email, whatever your email address is. And then we're going to do the same thing with the name. 
And now we're going to repeat our git commit, and we expect it to work. So here we see that it just worked, and we can run git status again, and see that we're on branch master, nothing to commit, working directory is clean. Now the next step is that we want to push this somewhere. So we can do something like git push origin master. Now we haven't defined what origin is yet, uh, but origin is the, the, the uh, standard or the convention that is used to represent the, the source of your source control. If you've got it, uh, a server somewhere that represents the, the, the master copy of this thing, perhaps it's at GitHub or Visual Studio Online, um, that's going to be your origin uh, and you're going to define that as a remote on your repository. We haven't done that yet, so when we try and do this, it's going to give us an error message and say that you don't have an origin anywhere here. Now, another thing that you can do with Git is you can actually push locally as long as you've got some .git file. So let's look at how you can do that. If we back up out of our hello git folder and we move to a shared folder, and this could be something like a, a Dropbox or a OneDrive folder if you wanted to um, use this as sort of a, a cheap way to back up your, your own personal projects. Personally, I would use GitHub, but, but just work with me here that that's an option. Now here you can say git init, and in this case we're going to say dash dash bear and create a .git file, and we'll call this, uh, how about hello git dot git, and now it's initialized that for us, and we want to remember that path because we're going to jump back to our hello folder, and now we're going to add this as a, a destination that we can use with our repository. So we're going to say git remote, add, and we need to give it a name. And so we don't want to use origin because that's what we'd usually refer to the, the remote server that we would work with. So I'm going to call this local, and I'm going to say slash c dev shared hello git dot git, and that should work. And now we have this added as something that we can push to, so we can say git push destination, in this case local, and which branch are we pushing? Master. And here we've now pushed this to that local Git repository. All right, so now let's take a look at source tree. And we can open up, if we go in here and say add working copy, navigate to our, our C drive, hello Git, and just open this folder up. We will see in here what, what we've just been working on. So we've got our master branch. It'll show us the history. We can see we're adding foo, adding git ignore. And this just gives us a way that we could fetch the, the local, pull things. We can come into settings and see that this is where local got set up as a remote um, that we can push to. And when you do a pool, it's going to default to whichever one the, the first one is because we only have one. Um, later on, if we had several, we could specify whether we wanted to pull from this local one or from origin or, or upstream. Um, we'll talk about more of those things in a future video. But that's source tree in a nutshell. You can just connect to a working folder. You can also use it to clone repositories from online services like GitHub. So let's take a look at GitHub real quick. And so here's my GitHub. And if I want to add a new repository, let me just show how this works if you've never done it before. You just give this repository a name and a description. If you belong to an organization, you can put it on that organization if you have the permissions. And specify whether it's public or private. And you can also add a gitignore file here. So you don't necessarily have to come up with one of these from scratch. A good idea is to create a gitignore file in GitHub that matches the, the type of project you're building. So if you're a .NET developer and you're building something with Visual Studio, you can add a Visual Studio .gitignore file and it will have all the usual things that you don't want to commit from Visual Studio, like your bin folder and things like that, already configured for you so you don't have to think about it. You can also specify a license and whether or not to initialize with a readme. All right, so I've already done this on Falafel Software. There we go. We're going to go to the Git Tips repository. And we're going to go through a simple exercise here that shows how to work with GitHub using Git. So in here, we've got some instructions here. They're going to say we're going to try and fork this repository, clone it locally, create a folder in here with my name, um, my Git username. Uh, add a file to it, and then update another file, and then commit. And then optionally, we're going to submit a pull request back to Falafel Software. And so what will happen is if a number of different people in the community actually go through this process, um, if you want to do it right now while you're following this video, uh, we will see this grow and have a number of different folders in it as different people complete this process. So GitHub has something unique to it called a fork that most of the other 
places where you'll use source control don't, don't really have a concept of, and it's one of the things that makes GitHub so popular for open source projects. Anyone can go to a public project like this and choose to fork it. And so I'm going to fork this to my personal repository, and this will just take a second. And now I will have Ardalis slash git tips, and it looks an awful lot like what I just copied it from because it is, in fact, just a clone of that repository. But now I can copy this URL here for my fork, and you can see that it knows about where it came from. It knows it came from Falafel Software git tips. And then I can come back into source tree and clone this. I can just specify the URL here and it will find it. Another nice thing that you can do is you can set up your credentials in a source tree and then go and find uh, whichever project you're trying to fork. And you can see here, since I have access to Falafel software and to this one, that I have access to it right here. And we'll clone this down now to local. And then if we want to follow the instructions, all we need to do is jump to that folder. A good trick in source tree is that you can say commit, and when there's nothing to commit, there's a nice button here to open it in Explorer. So we'll do that. The instructions were to create a folder. So we're going to create a new folder with my git name. And then we're going to put some file in there. All right, at that point, we're done. Now, one thing to know about Git is that it will not notice empty folders. So we had to create that file because if we'd only created the folder, it wouldn't have actually done anything and, and allowed us to do a commit because it will just ignore empty folders. So here we see our unstaged file. We're going to stage it. That's the equivalent of doing an add at the command line. And then we're going to commit it. And we'll check this box here to automatically push it. So this is doing a git commit and a git push in one operation when I click this button. And it's going to tell me that it needs to know who I am because, again, I didn't do that globally. So let me just do that real quick. And we'll try that again. All right, so now we have committed this. And you'll see a nice feature in source tree is that it'll keep track of both your local master here as well as remote, in this case, origin. Um, so we've got origin, master, origin head, and master all pointing at the same thing, which is this current version that we have. And it also supports this graph that we'll look at in later videos showing all the different branches and, and how they have diverged or merged together over the course of working with your project. At this point, we can go back to GitHub. And GitHub is going to see that we've got this thing all ready to go now. All right, so there's my refresh. We've got our Dallas. We added the file. Uh, we didn't do the other step. I missed a step, which was add your GitHub profile to that. So let me go grab my GitHub profile, come back, jump back to file system. We're going to just open this and put in that URL. Finish that. Add another commit. Now we've actually completed the instructions correctly. So we can go back in here, and we're ready to uh, issue a pull request. So we're on this fork, and we want to create a pull request back to the master. And this is how you can contribute to open source projects very efficiently using GitHub. So we'll click on this button here, and it's going to say create pull request. Uh, it's going to show us what's in this pull request. There's two commits. There's two files changed. It was by one contributor. You can look and see what everything was. We'll create the pull request and say, adding me, create. Now, the owner of Falafel Software Inc. slash Git Tips gets notified when this occurs. Uh, and they can come to this, this page here and see any open pull requests. And so in this case, Right now, there's, there's just this one that was added just now. But you can come in here, and, and we could have a conversation about this. We could look at um, the individual files. We could go see which files were changed. I can add a comment right here on this line and say, you know, you didn't put in the right URL. And add that comment, and it lets you have a line-by-line -line conversation about the changes that were made in this pull request um, right inside of the browser. Uh, it, with all this stuff sending out email notifications as well, if you wish. Uh, makes it very 
useful for doing um, code reviews if you do pull requests for your changes, even if it's um, just you working in your small team with a private GitHub repository. Once somebody's reviewed this, um, they can come back into it and accept the pull request and merge it. And ideally, it should be something that can be automatically merged because then it's easy. But uh, if need be, you might have to drop down to the command line and, and merge things yourself. If you follow the instructions in this Git tips repository, you should not ever run into a merge conflict because everything's going to be done in separate folders. Uh, the only thing that could ever possibly have a conflict is that completed by file. So now we can merge this pull request. We can add a comment here as well if we want, confirm. And then at this point, we're done with, with this step. Now, if I had created a branch in my fork to do this work, it would also prompt me right now to say, hey, do you want to go ahead and delete that branch because you've completed this pull request? And again, we'll talk more about pull requests in a future video. Thanks for watching. I hope you found this video helpful. Here are some other resources that you may find useful as you continue to learn about using Git for your source control. And of course, continue to check out additional videos on this channel from Falafel Software.